yeah, okay, let's start. Uh, when I received an email that Planet Argon will host a Ruby Brigade meetup, I thought, when I will have a better chance to participate in community events uh, as a speaker. So here I am. Uh, hi, my name is Sona, and I'm a software engineer with Planet Argon. I've been developing Ruby application in outsourcing companies for the last five years, so I've seen some things. Uh, I've noticed that the majority of clients uh, come to agencies with uh, the similar sets of problems in their applications. First time I saw it, I decided that this is mistakes of previous teams. But after seeing the same things happen in different applications, made by different teams, I realized that the reason of these mistakes is somewhere deeper. So today I want to discuss an issue which is one of the most difficult and expensive to fix, in my opinion. But first, let's talk a little about MVC pattern. According to it, business logic belongs in models. Also, Rails best practices teach us that we should have skinny controllers and fat models. It works pretty well for small projects, but as they grow, models can become enormous. I once worked on a project with models longer than 3,000 lines. Mm -hmm. That's not sounds like good architecture, right? Mm -hmm. uh, plus in Rails, it's hard to split application and business logic. So in most applications, you can find business logic spread evenly between controllers and models. It's pretty hard to follow don't repeat yourself principle in situations like that. This is a generic example of controller action, which contains a lot of business logic, such as updating annotation for a post, uh, building response object, and choosing status depending on the conditions. And I've seen plenty of actions like that on different projects from different teams. There is one more problem with FAT models in pure MVC Rails applications. They violate the singular responsibility principle, uh, and usually in models you can find scope, validation, state machine, abilities, and more and more and more. Of course, developers try to solve those issues in a lot of different ways. The most popular ones is include moving. Uh, in, the most popular ones is moving business logic from controllers to servers. Uh, extracting reusable code in models, uh, defining complex, complex custom validations in validators, and etc. But I think there is a less popular but much better way. Uh, and let's try to use dryRB gems. First of all, what is dryRB? dryRB is an ecosystem of gems which could be plugged in separately to fulfill a specific task or used together to provide a platform for Ruby applications. As today we talk about business logic location within applications, I want to show you how, just, how using just a couple of those gems can help you to solve enormous models problem in Rails projects. As an example, let's try to implement a standard feature, user creation. Our starting point will be creating user controller with create action. As you can see, controller contains only application logic. All business logic encapsulated in operation, uh, which we call here. You might be wondering what an operation is. Here is a source code of operation. Operation is a class which contains of two parts div divided into two internal classes. First part, called containers, is driven by dry container gem and contains definitions of operation steps. Second part, called transaction, uh, is driven by dry transaction gem and contains the steps execution order. As you can see, the first step in this transaction is validate, which is defined in shard namespace. So you can easily reuse this step between different operations. Don't repeat yourself. Let's dive into this validate step. Here is a source code of validate step. The most important part here is the schema call. What is schema? Schema is our validation object, object which is provided by dry validation and dry schema gem. 
the name of exact schema had been passed from operation class here on the line 48. Uh, this is a sort co source code of uh, schema. Schema encapsulates all the validations which controller params should pass. This, codes, uh, this code checks that params uh, from controller contain only three keys, email, username, and roles. All of them are required. Each value should conform to restrictions provided in block. After passing validations, we will move to the next step in the queue. Uh, in the next step, we can see pretty standard code of object creation with one interesting detail. If it was able to create a user, it would return success result uh, with provided arguments. Uh, if not, it would return failure result. In case of successful result, the execution will go to the next step. In case of the failure, operation will return failure result back to controller. The, resu the result uh, of the last step is returned back to controller as operation result. And usually it's successful result. Uh, uh, so as I mentioned before, uh, operation failure or success result uh, handled in controller. Oh, I forget to mention that in this example, our last step would be notify about user created. Uh, here we put a message about user creation to success result. And here in controller, uh, I decided to show this success message uh, as a flash notice. Uh, this code located in concerns and includes to controller and code from controller. Let's make a conclusion. As usual, there is no silver bullet. Uh, using dryer B has its pros and cons. As pros, you will have uh, validations only in schemas. Uh, you, all business logic of your application uh, will locate it in operations. Uh, in your models, you will have only data access. Uh, in controllers, you will have only application logic. Uh, you will have reusable steps. You will have super maintainable code, which is easy to test by integration specs. But big disadvantage, disadvantage uh, is that it's really difficult to start using this solution uh, in existing big projects. You will have to break current architecture of the project, which could be really expensive to your clients. Here is a couple of useful links if you want to learn more about uh, Dryer B ecosystem or about problem of fat models in Rails. That was just an example of how you can use Dryer B gems in your application. This library contains a lot of gems for solving different issues, not only what I was talking about today. Hope you've taken an interesting uh, interest in the topic and we'll find something useful for your projects. Thanks for your attention. Yeah. Can we look at your code slides again and you can explain to me what's going on? Because it's been a while since I've written Rails apps full time, but it's very interesting to me, this concept. I want to maybe like look at um, one of the slides that had many codes on it that I didn't get a chance to read all of and, and ask you questions about it. Oh, sure. If that's allowed, do you mind terribly? Yeah, so like here, this is a perfect example. So there's operations namespace. I'm putting everything under an operations module. Operations is part of dry container and dry transaction? Uh, this solution which I showed today, it's uh, like my solution of how you can use dryer B gems. Okay. Uh, you can use it in different ways. You can, uh, in your application, you can not use Rails at all. Uh, you can use Ruby and dryer B as a platform for your application. So this is just my interpretation, how you, how you can use and how you can build uh, how you can encapsulate business logic somewhere not in controller or in model. I like this. So. This is brilliant, by the way. Well done. <laughs> the transaction step where it shows me all of the steps. Uh, yeah. So 
huge amount of time I spend debugging a Rails application where I'm like, okay, and then what happens? And then <laughs> what happens? And then what happens? Like, having it all written out makes it really easy to understand. But that transaction, this dry transaction, is part of dry transaction. Yeah, transaction is part of dry transaction gem, and container is a part of dry container gem. Uh, the container then, when you register a key, those are designed to work together. Uh, in container, you register. Uh, in container, you register a step definition, so you can easily reuse the steps. Uh, like for example, you have, like for example, validation step, validate step. You can define this validate step here in this container, or you can move it, as I did, to some another space. Uh, and then reuse for uh, a lot of uh, operations, a lot of transactions, because like almost everywhere in application, you have to validate each, validate object what you want to create. And uh, here is like source code to validate. And as you can see, it's super generic, and you really can do like all validations code, all validations you store here in schemas. So this step is super generic and super useful. Does this bypass the Rails validation stuff that's in there, or is it in addition to that? Uh, this call schema, oh, okay. and this schema passed here in transaction. Uh, you make new transaction in this operation mod, uh, class. You make new transaction with arguments. And to validate step, you provide this argument with the name of your validation. Here, you call this validation. And this is which exact validations your params uh, should pass. So this is the part that's actually using the Rails. Like when I would normally say validates. This, dry, okay. this is dry validation gem. Yeah. It's not Rails. <laughs> None of this is using Rails built-in validation code at all. This like, uh, steps all of the Rails. Like when I build a Rails model, yeah, I know. Validates presence true email, right? Uh, here, presence true uh, is field uh, predicate. Field predicate the same as validate true, and it, this predicate in, uh, field built in dry validation gem. Email uh, is uh, custom. Uh, predicate, and you can. Okay, let's <laughs> talk oh, a little bit right. about dry validation. Yeah, yeah. Field is field string uh, array. It's built in dry validation gem functions. Uh, email minimum size, maximum size. It's custom validations. Oh, okay. So there is no rails. Okay. You can use uh, you. Use only dry RB or dry schema gem, uh, dry validation or dry schema gem. So. <laughs> awesome, thank you. I asked a lot of questions right in a row, so somebody else gets a turn. Does anyone else have questions for someone? I mean, I'm going to keep going if you don't, because I'm very curious about <laughs> dry RB stuff. Is that okay? Can I ask one more real fast? Yeah, sure. This is kind of a technical weirdness of Rails, but if you update a model or you update attributes, on a model, something different happens. And in, when you do update attributes, it bypasses the validations. Have you ever heard of this problem? Uh, like if I say like user.update attributes email and I set it to nil, that that bypasses validations. I was, I'm only asking because I'm curious if you happen to know if this stops that problem because it's a big problem <laughs> that I find in Rails apps all the time, but uh, you know, maybe not. So when you decided to use uh, this architecture using RB architecture of your application, you will have to update your object using operations, transactions, and validation as well. Yeah. So you, of, if you use Rails, of course you can just update attribute, but I think someone have to reject this pull this request. request right. Yeah, <laughs> we'll, we'll see it because we'll all be used to doing it this way. We'll see yeah, it. yeah. If you want to update your uh, object, you have to build operation for update process. I had never heard of dry RB. Thank you very much. <laughs> One more round of applause for someone.